Hello, sisters. I'm delighted to have you all here today for a discussion of two books on separatism. I'm joined today by Susan Hawthorne and Lauren Levy. Now, the three of us became separatists in the 1970s on three different continents. Susan in Australia, me in the UK and Laurel in the US. And the forms that separatism took were shaped by their context. And I hope we will talk a little bit about these differences today. Now, the books are uh, Flow, For Lesbians Only, A Separatist Anthology, which is edited by Sarah Lucia Hoagland and Julia Penelope. And In Defense of Separatism, which is by Susan Hawthorne. Finif Express published this in 2019, but it's originally from 1976. And the For Lesbians Only is a collection published in 1988. I'll just introduce the, uh, the others, uh, lesbians with talking with me today. Susan Hawthorne joined the Women's Liberation Movement in 1973. Uh, she, in 1976, she wrote her long essay in defense of separatism, which was finally published in full in 2019. She is the author and editor of many lesbian books, including Dark Matters, a novel, 2017, The Sacking of the Muses, Poetry, 2019, and Vortex, the Crisis of Patriarchy 2020. With Renata Klein, she's the co-founder of Spinifex Press Australia, which is a wonderful holdout uh, feminist press, which is publishing radical feminism today when pretty much nobody else is. Lauren Levy uh, was born in Brooklyn in New York. She has won a number of unrelated career hats worn a number of unrelated war career hats, including music faculty at Dartmouth College, lawyer, editor of science journals, innkeeper at a lesbian guest town in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Wish I'd stayed at that. She helped fellow college students get illegal but safe abortions. She helped found the Sirens Women's Motorcycle Club in New York City and served on the board of directors from Lesbian Gay Bisexual Center in suburban New York City, uh, battling against the inclusion of the tea, which is very interesting. She's organized and facilitated consciousness raising groups and lesbian coming out groups. And she presently serves as vice president of the US chapter of the Women's Liberation International. She lives in upstate New York and she rides a motor my motorcycle a lot. Now, we are lucky enough to have the author of one of today's books, In Defense of Separatism, with us, and I will go to her first. So, Susan, can you tell me, or can tell us, about the context out of which your book arose, what shape separatism took in 1970s Melbourne, and how and why you became a, a, a separatist? Also about what separatism meant to you at that time and how you explained it in the book. You're muted, Susan. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, in Australia, we acknowledge the indigenous land on which we live and I'm speaking to you from Jiru land in far North Queensland. Melbourne was a hive of activity in the 1970s and I was really quickly drawn into feminist activism and culture and some of the all women groups that I was part of uh, or in the arts watched and heard were Women's Liberation House, I was a volunteer, Rape Crisis Centre, volunteer, uh, the women's dancers I attended, um, oh and the half uh, halfway house which is a refuge I was a volunteer there uh, we went to women's dances there was a women's theatre group we watched their performances they were, these were all women's groups no men women's bands like clitoris from Sydney um, the women's electric band from Melbourne and the shameless hussies from Adelaide and there were others in other states 
We went to all women conferences. I ate at the No Men, No Meat restaurant. Uh, I was buying books from Sibylla Feminist Press. I was reading feminist and lesbian books from all around the world. There was a women's poster, a collective art group. There was a women's art gallery, women's films, a women's pub. So some of these extended into the 1980s and 90s, uh, but the first six or seven were all in the 1970s. In northern New South Wales, Amazon Acres and the Women's Lands started up in the mid-70s. These were a real inspiration. Women there built houses, they drove tractors, they used various tools associated with men and they ran the places for many years. They still function, these places. You can read Karen Higgs's essay in Not Dead Yet if you want to know more detail because it, it is a truly fascinating story of what the women there achieved. Um, later, there were the Amazon Games. There were sports as well as various sports teams that I watched and I joined the Women's Circus and the Performing Older Women's Circus. Everywhere, there were always new groups starting up, so it's impossible to name, name them all, even in Melbourne where I lived. In inner city Melbourne, I lived a separatist lifestyle with my intellectual, emotional, political and social life revolving around women. So my lesbian life began in 1974. So it didn't take me much time to get out of it from joining the movement in 1973. And it was a thrilling time to be a lesbian with so much energy these organisations were led by a mix of lesbian and heterosexual women, led and maintained by, I should say. Um, there were lots of arguments, especially about whether men could attend conferences, but on the whole, they were excluded even from big conferences at universities. Studying at Latrobe University, and at the end of 1975, I was accepted into the honours program. Uh, Susan, 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 sorry, there's a lot of crackling coming. I, sorry, I wonder, was, are you, you're doing something with paper onto your mic, so maybe yes. stop sorry. doing it. Yeah. Okay, done. Um, as I said, I was accepted into the Honours Project uh, program and I had refused to study logic, but one of my teachers said, but she's read Tarski and Carnap and they were such heavyweights that they had to let me in. And after a two week motorbike holiday with two friends in Tasmania, I said I'd like to write in defense of separatism. I knew it was tricky, but I had a great feminist philosophy supervisor. And because it was philosophy, it had to be well argued. And I looked at ideas around the theories of power and oppression, domination and institutions. But when I look back at it now, I notice that I wrote about coercive power, including noting that it's not always physical force, but can and include economic and emotional threats. I then turned to looking at the things that were peculiar to women's oppression, and they include heterosexuality as an institution. That was a real eye opener coming to that conclusion. Rape as an instance of coercive power, and romantic love as another instance of power. And I argue that equal relations between women and men are not possible. I finish with a section on strategies in which I include separatism and lesbian feminism. And I argue that feminism is inherently separatist, starting with consciousness raising groups, women only political action and protests, as well as groups like rape crisis and women's health centres, social gatherings, women's art collectives, uh, as well as becoming woman identified, lesbian or celibate, and through to living in all women or all lesbian communities. The critical thing in all of these is that it's done for a political purpose. So you can range from the bare minimum to the maximum but if you've got a political project going, then 
that is a form of separatism. While social groups for, thinking, for drinking tea or coffee or playing cards play an important role in women's lives, time out, staying sane, all of that kind of stuff, they would not count as separatist actions without the political dimension. I also considered critiques of separatism and my responses to these critiques because it was after all in the area of philosophy, I had to do that. Right at the end, I wrote up the statement of argument, which, start, which is at the beginning of the book. When it came to assessment, one of the assessors was a very famous philosopher, very popular philosopher, with whom I'd had an argument during that year about rape. He thought that rape was just the same as being mugged. So I knew he was one of my assessors and I was angry but not surprised when I received my result, which would mean I could not go on to do a postgrad degree. And in Australia, that dividing line is at the um, second class honours B. If I'd gotten an H2A, I would have been able to, but I got an H2B which means throw her out. Um, separatism, I concluded, uh, was the only way that we were going to get ahead. I also suggested that men were capable of change, but that liberation meant doing it for oneself. That is, no one is going to liberate you. And that was the end of my academic career at that point. <laughs> Is that, is that sort of, or you'll finish this little section of what you're going to say, Susan, is that fair? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Lauren is going to speak a bit about herself and how she, she came to separatism later on during her section. I'll just say a little bit about the context of Britain. I do think that the UK was more like America, as it was, sorry, less like America, and Australia was more like America. We didn't really have women's land or barely at all. Women were not all out uh, building houses and driving their four wheel drives. Um, lesbian feminism and lesbian separatism was much more urban. It was, as Susan was saying, about all of the women's bands and the women's theatre and living a life of lesbian culture, emotionally and intellectually in every way around women. And there was so much going on. You could live your whole life around women apart from going to your paid jobs. We mostly had paid jobs with men uh, in some form or another, but uh, we lived our lives with women. And I think in Britain in the 1970s, the ideas about separatism were coming through mainly from the US. Uh, for instance, the, the clit statements, part one and two, clit as in clitoris, uh, but spelt C dot L dot I dot T dot in the uh, book. Uh, they were republished in Catcall, which was um, a lesbian newsletter in the UK, probably around 76 or so. So the ideas filtered through, they came out um, duplicated in, in little pamphlets and so on. So that's where the ideas were coming from. So when I became a lesbian as a result of the ideas about um, the importance of lesbianism and so on, in 1977, I became a separatist at the same time and asked the two young men living in my apartment to leave. So that was it bang onto the scene, as it were. I, I saw myself then, and I think I still do now, as what Janice Raymond calls an insider-outsider. You are insider in the sense that you work in institutions that are male institutions, and you try to change laws and the state and so on. But at the same time, your outsider life is a life entirely with women, women's ideas, women's culture, and so on. Um, so, I think I think that was that's how it was um, for me in the UK. I'm sure somebody will now come into the chat and say there was women's land in Wales and I was in it. But actually, the rest of us didn't know anything pretty much about any of that. So what I'm going to do is um, introduce the two editors of this volume, both of whom are very important in the development of lesbian culture and theory. Um, the first of these is Sarah Lucia Hoagland. And at the time of the book's publication in 1988, she described herself as teaching philosophy and women's studies at Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago. Uh, she became a lesbian in 1975. She's written the important lesbian feminist book, Lesbian Ethics Towards New Value. 
and she is presently the Bernard Brommel Distinguished Research Professor and Professor Emerita of Philosophy and Women's Studies at the same university, Northeastern Illinois University. And she's a member of the Lesbian Studies Institute of Chicago. Uh, I don't know Sarah at all well, but I have been lucky to meet her several times and hear her speak. And I do remember going to her house in Chicago and being amazed by the amount of cat furniture. I will never forget it. Um, I saw her again briefly in 2018 at the Radfan Conference in Chicago, and she's still going strong. Um, the other editor, Julia Penelope, um, died in 2013 at 71 years. She, she was a f feminist philosopher, lesbian feminist philosopher, linguist and author. She was out as a lesbian from early in life and thrown out of two universities because of this. And she was the author of Speaking Freely, Unlearning the Lies of the Father's Tongues in 1990, which was about linguistics and much more. And she's written in, in, incisive criticism of practices within the lesbian community in the US, such as said masochism and butch femme role playing and used all of her very long experience of being a lesbian before there was feminism at all to criticize those things and wonderful writings. She's got very important pieces in flow, but we may need to do another session of Rad Pen Perspectives on her work specifically to come anywhere near doing it justice. I was lucky enough to meet with Julia for dinner once when I was in Boston, um, but I'm pleased to say she must have trusted me because in the 1990s, when she was going through a great deal of disillusionment about the feminist movement and having hard times, she contacted me in Australia, where I was at the time, asking me to come to the US and rescue her archives, which I'm sure were considerable, and work out what to do with them. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, and I was in Australia, there was no way I could really do this, but I do think that they are now somewhere safe in a collection. Now, the publication of Flow for Lesbians Only was uh, quite difficult. It is, I should start, say from the start, only US and some Canadian French speaking material. Um, there doesn't seem to have been any attempt to get material from the UK and the separatism was different there. So that would have been interesting, but it would have been a huge, huge book. Uh, they do say in the intro, it's primarily US. Uh, they started the project in 1980. Um, and it collect, the papers in it are from 1970 to 1984. And they put it aside in 84 because no US publisher either it was, would, would take it. It was either too big for small presses or it was politically unacceptable. And in 1986, the UK small lesbian press, only women press, contacted them to ask for it. And this shows the crucial importance of independent lesbian and radical feminist publishing without presses like Spin FX or Only Women Press. We could not have these books and we would not have them now. Uh, Only Women Press was wonderful in London, doing lots of pamphlets as well as books that were actually crucial to lesbian and feminist theorizing and of course much poetry. Now the book contains some very important basic texts of lesbian feminist theory that are not necessarily or exclusively about separatism, as well as texts specifically addressing the issue from both very well-known lesbian theorists, as well as much less well, less well-known separatists. For instance, we have in there Marion Fry's wonderful piece, some reflections on separatism and power from 1977, the uh, black lesbian separatist Anna Lee, uh, Julia Penelope, of course, Alex Dobkin has a piece in there. Uh, there's a Mary Daly extract and Monique Wittig. So it's very, very important. Lesbian feminist work is collected here together in a way that it isn't anywhere else. What I'm going to do now is go on to Lauren Levy and ask Lauren to tell us about the origins and history of the US separatism out of which the anthology arose and hopefully a little bit about herself as well and how she came to separatism. Thanks Sheila. So the second wave lesbian, the second wave women's liberation movement began in the 1960s in New York City and it, it spread <clears throat> with breathtaking speed and soon we had women only music festivals, lesbian collectives, book publishers and other businesses and rural land dyke communities. But the movement was born when it's separated from the anti-war and black civil rights movements here. 
the, the, this origin may help us understand the character of the early women's liberation movement in the US, especially in the following ways. The movement started as a child of the far left, which had revolutionary content already, right? Black women were among the founders. Audre Lorde and Flo Kennedy, for instance, were not tokens, they were leaders from the outset. This is not to say that racism was the, in the movement was never a problem, <laughs> but the, the founders of the women's liberation movement here were used to addressing racism within their ranks. And, and, um, and that the movement was not started by white middle-class board suburban straight housewives as anti-feminist revisionists uh, often like to claim these days. The black civil rights movement contained black separatist strands. So the notion of separatism was also there from the very beginning. Women separating from the male left can itself be seen as an act of political separatism and as such a politically lesbian act. So the women's liberation movement, um, I, I would say from its inception was a separatist uh, movement and a lesbian movement. Um, I think that's all I wanna say at this point. I'll, I'll come back later. Sheila, you're muted. Sheila, you're muted. Yeah, Laurie, can, can you now um, talk about the way that separatism was criticized because it was controversial and it's particularly controversial now. I think something a lot of women th these days don't realize is the tremendous rage that feminists had in the 1970s and early 1980s. There was fury at what men did to women and that's, that's very much muted these days, although I think it's coming back to some extent. So I think these days separatism is much less well understood, though I would argue very much needed, than it was then. So can you talk about the sort of criticisms that were made and the responses to them? Sure. Um, here are some arguments offered by editor Sarah Hoagland in support of separatism. The purposes of separatism are first, to remove yourself from the threat, and second, to allow yourself to focus on women so that you can create authentic lesbian ident identity and communities, a creative process. When you withdraw or separate, you refuse to act by the system's rules, which means you refuse to validate the system's values. So separatism can lead to the creation of new values. Those in power don't want us to see that non-participation is a choice, but it is. You can stay and try to change the system, or you can withdraw your support from it. Sarah Hoagland notes that both choices have risks. Directly challenging the system risks validating it. You're participating in a system that attacks women and erases lesbians. On the other hand, Withdrawing may allow the system to continue unimpeded. She, she quotes Joyce Treblecott, who wrote that um, separating literally creates power uh, for the women who separate, while also depriving men of the power that they would otherwise have had over those women. But is separatism a way of hiding from reality? We hear that all the time. Sarah Hoagland says that those who ask that question implicitly believe that patriarchy is the only reality and that what men call revolution is the only revolution and that what men call change is the only change. Then she observes, related is the issue of widening uh, feminist politics to include greater numbers. Early radical feminism presented a choice for women. Watering down the politics to make them more palatable undermines that choice. It is more important to make the values and choices clear and allow each woman to choose than to lure a woman on false pretenses or worse to change feminist politics itself to include those who would actually reject feminist values. Um, separatism has been accused of, of racism. Sarah Hoagland looks at three such accusations. One, separatists allegedly don't acknowledge that men of color are oppressed. Two, the only way to end racism is to work in coalitions with men. And three, some women of color don't feel comfortable separating from men. In rebuttal, she points out that some black women and some white women and some Jewish women feel quite comfortable separating from men. As Anna Lee, a black lesbian uh, in, the, in the Scientology writes, the ideology of separating from males is racist only if one accepts that males define ethnic community, right? She goes on to say um, the more significant problem is that if lesbians and women of color and or Jewish lesbians and women separate, the separation is not only from the values of uh, white capitalist patriarchy, but also from the values of black or Puerto Rican or Jewish culture. The writers in this book also discuss the problem of dual or multiple oppressions and loyalties. The, the authors that do that do not totally reject their ethnic origins, though there is separation from the masculinist parts of their cultures. 
And then what happens is the lesbian separatists bring their ethnic cultural values to lesbian community where they enrich lesbian values. She points out that that labeling separatism racist per se is a dishonest device meant to dismiss separatism without debate. It silences productive argument. The, the 1984 piece by uh, Betty S. Talon in this anthology uh, discusses Jewish separatism and black separatism in which virtually all social and commercial dealings were accomplished within the ethnic community. She observes that ethnic groups in the US stayed together not only to maintain cultural integrity, but also to survive in the face of exploitation. To some, the choice to assimilate might enhance financial success at the cost of cultural integrity. But for the most part, being separate was not a choice. It was the only way to survive. Malcolm X made a crucial distinction between segregation and separatism. Segregation is imposed by an oppressor. Separatism is chosen by the oppressed. He observed that the white man will integrate you before he'll let you celebrate, uh, separate. <laughs> um, like Betty S. Talon, author, um, I grew up with somewhat religious Jewish parents. They frequently struggled to balance their Jewishness with their desire to assimilate and participate in the dominant culture. They saw themselves as Jews, but also as Americans, New Yorkers in particular, and other things too. They had an understanding of the injustice of Jew hating, and they sought out Jewish merchants and professionals preferentially. They thought some Gentile doctors might deliberately kill them, and I'm not sure they were wrong. I've had that thought about certain male doctors also that I've encountered. Um, but lesbian separatism is different from racial or ethnic separatism. As women, lesbians are not segregated by men into lesbian neighborhoods or lesbian families. Lesbians are instead separated from each other physically and emotionally and systematically bonded to men by patriarchal family structures. This is the cultural norm. There is no approved lesbian bonding in patriarchy. There, is there are political states established by and for predominantly black or ethnic populations. Um, even when an ethnic political state has been um, destroyed, the world still considers the populace to be a nation or a people. Armenians or Jews or Ukrainians, for instance, are each seen as a people with or without a, a territorial a political sovereignty. But although there are lesbian residential land communities in the US, there is no lesbian political sovereignty anywhere in the world. And there is also no recognized non-state lesbian nation or people. It is a task of lesbian separatism to achieve, in Betty S. Talon's words, the development of an autonomous self-identity and the creation of a strong, solid lesbian community. My DNA says I'm 100% Ashkenazi Jew. I've mastered the iconic chicken soup of my foremothers, although success with matzo balls eludes me. I can understand some Hebrew and I've tour toured Israel by motorcycle, but women and especially lesbians are my main people. I seek out women's land, um, uh, women, sorry, I seek out women's and especially uh, lesbian businesses whenever I can. I'm proud and not surprised that, lesbian, uh, that Jewish women and Jewish lesbians were way overrepresented among early radical feminists and lesbian separatists, considering that Jews are only 2% of the US population. But unlike my parents, my priority is all women, and especially lesbians. When I experience Jew hating from lesbians, <clears throat> it's shocking and painful and disappointing. But my political priority is still all women, including both Jewish women and those who hate Jewish women or other minorities, all for now. Um, can I just add about um, segregation and the difference between separatism and segregation? Um, yes. Lucia uh, Valeska in 1975 wrote this, the chief difference between the two is how they're used, by whom and for what purposes. Segregation is used by the economically dominant group as a means of social control. That is to maintain and perpetuate a given economic political and social stratification system, whereas separatism is used by the economically disadvantaged in order to radically alter existing political, social and economic arrangements. And I found that, that quotation really, really helpful to me. Yeah, it, it's a good one, Sue. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to just talk about the opening um, the opening piece in the book here, because it is such a very important piece, uh, written in 1970. It's the Woman Identified Woman paper by radical lesbians, which is really, um, it's a sort of rallying cry, early rallying cry for lesbian feminism, which is really important. It's a lesbifesto, one could say, written 50 years ago. And the opening sentence is of huge importance. It says, what is a lesbian? 
a lesbian is the rage of all women condensed to the point of explosion, which is, of course, hugely important. And it's a it's sort of it's a, it's a battle cry, if you like, for lesbian feminism. It is rage condensed to the point of explosion. She is the woman who, often beginning at a very early age, acts in accordance with her inner compulsion to be a more complete and freer human being that her, than her society cares to allow her. And that was just such an important statement. And of course, within a few years, when lesbians said a masochism developed in the US, uh, they, they, it, was, it was made into a totally different slogan on pornogra their pornographic publish, publicity material. And it said, a lesbian is the lust of all women condensed to the point of explosion. Well, no, lesbian feminism and lesbian separatism was not all lust, it was all rage, and that was really important. There's lots of famous bits in the paper. Um, they say, for instance, that until women see in each other the possibility of primal commitment, which includes sexual love, in other words, accept that they can be lesbians, they will be denying themselves the love and value they readily accord to men, thus affirming their second class status. So it's, one, it's a wonderfully sort of rousing piece. And they say, our energies must flow towards our sisters, not backwards towards our oppressors. And I think that was very important. When I became a separatist, I wanted my energies to be in a closed system where I was giving them out to other women, not wasting them upon uh, the world of men. As long as women's liberation tries to free women without facing the basic heterosexual structure that binds us in one-to-one -one relations with a man, this obviously splits our energies and commitments. It leaves us unable to be committed to the construction of the new patterns which will liberate us. I'd just like to say about that, that in that early piece, 1970, and continuing throughout the 70s, lesbian feminists and lesbian separatists were analyzing heterosexuality as the basic structure of women's oppression. Absolutely crucial. Now, I'm just going to go over to Susan now and ask her if there are any pieces of flow that she really likes or thinks important that she'd like to talk about? Um, most of the articles that I found really interesting were the first ones, probably because that was when I was experiencing and thinking and all of that. Yeah. And that, that sentence from the woman identified woman about uh, rage uh, was known in Melbourne. You know, this, we didn't have the internet, but we, these things somehow got to us. Yep. Uh, it, it was also clear to me that relations between women lay at the heart of an effective women's liberation struggle. We argued about whether sex or race was the first oppression, and we argued, that is, and if you argue today, you're called a bully, but we really argued. You know, we didn't get up with fisticuffs, but we had shouting matches sometimes. Um, Jeannie Burson's 1970 two piece on the Furies is really fabulous. And again, we knew about the Furies. Um, and it was probably knowledge of ancient Greek Furies that led me to a, a later interest in mythology. Um, and the name the Furies was chosen. And Ginny Burson says that because they were angry about living in a fucked up patriarchal system. And she also writes that most straight women and men feel contemptuous of lesbians and compared it to, to how middle class whites feel towards blacks and lower class people. So we were talking all about class, we were talking about race all, right from the word go. Another aspect is that they were developing long range strategies and short term tactics, projects and actions. And that's what we were also doing in, in Melbourne in, and across Australia. Julia Penelope turns what was happening at the time into a story. And she writes, the women began to leave the men singly at first, then in two to threes. This was happening all around the world. I was, and I also saw it. Marilyn Fry writes about how dependent men are on women and that they fall into chaotic lives when women are not around. And I've seen TV programs and articles about women in Kenya and in India who've also noticed this and have set up their own women-only villages and they just keep the men out. Um, um, Marilyn Fry also writes that the women-only meeting is a challenge to the structure of power. 
it declares that she is not a slave. Um, I, I really like the lesbian separatist statement from the Jewish Feminist Conference because it reminds me of the heated arguments that we had. I recall one in 1976 at the Women's Liberation House with writer Helen Garner, a famous Australian writer. Uh, it was a stout between heterosexual women and lesbians. Point three of the statement reads, we believe it a political principle that any oppressed group can separate themselves from their oppressors and as lesbians we claim that right. So I, I write about this in the preface to my book that my book, although it was written in 1976, wasn't published until 2019, but nobody would publish it for me. So eventually when the tide began to turn, I thought, okay, maybe now is the time. So I wrote a, a preface and um, I say, when a political group wants to strategize so its members can arrive at agreed on political tactics, they call for and create separate spaces. The difference between women and other oppressed groups is that women are supposed to love men. That changes. That's one of the reasons why separatism is, is so tricky or is so hated. Um, I also thought that the Sydney Spinster piece was really, uh, it was a really good summary of the way in which separatist action changed. Um, and so important were the magazines, even if they only ran for one issue or a few issues, and the songs by Alex Dobkin and Linda Shear, to mention just a few of them. Um, Monique Vitti's essays, The Straight Mind, was not yet published in the mid-70s, but her book, The Getty Airs, was. And I have my copy here, and you can see it is most, much read. Um, and it has the date 9 of October 1975. And I remember being thoroughly blown away by reading this book. I have read it now multiple times. Uh, and I quote her in, in the front of my book, Looper and Lamb. And I'm really inspired by her. In July 1976, I bought a copy of The Lesbian Body which was sort of the same, uh, written in the same kind of style, but it put lesbians at the center. So I had both of these books fresh in my mind as I wrote In Defense of Separatism. Her essay, The Straight Mind, caused confusion among many readers because she writes in her last sentence, lesbians are not women. No, this is not something about trans. She's, and this was really misunderstood. She means that women do not stand in the relates, uh, lesbians do not stand in the same relation to men as do heterosexual women. In the other essay, in For Lesbians Only, One Is Not Born a Woman, she says this even more clearly. She writes about lesbians' refusal to go beyond the categories of sex, woman and man, because the lesbian is not a woman, either economically or politically or ideologically that lesbians have moved themselves from a relation of servitude with men. And in, in defense of separatism, I wrote, the real importance of women working together without men is not confidence or self-esteem, but rather that women can affirm their political accord not connected to any man. That is, women can become separate beings and that lesbian feminism promoted relations between women because women are the primary group to whom lesbian feminists are committed. The patriarchal structures and models of relating are rejected. So some years later, I had a personal experience of the way in which transgenderists, that is men who claim to be women, destroy women's groups. And I write about that in my most recent uh, book, Vortex, The Crisis of Patriarchy. Uh, this experience came much later, but my reaction was informed by my understanding of power relations and how men mess up women's lives simply through their presence. Thanks, Susan. 
And I absolutely agree <laughs> that, that with what you said, that you, we are not allowed to hate men now. I mean, women have never been allowed to hate men. And men, of course, have a massive industry of woman hating, which is pornography, which is now constructing the way women are viewed and allowing men to express their extraordinary hatred. And it is completely extraordinary. And that's, of course, absolutely massive. And of course, they express it on social media to women in the streets and so on. So hating women from men is absolutely huge. Meanwhile, women are expected to be deferential and doff their caps and are simply not in any position to express the completely ordinary rage that it would be very surprising, I think, if any woman did not have. I mean, that, how women's rage is suppressed and not a, out there in the world is a really, really significant question, I think. Um, I was going to say something about Monique Wittig, but I, I won't now because you have been talking about her and said the things I wanted to say, so that's great. <laughs> what I do think is that The Straight Mind, which is her collection of essays, is something we should talk about later on in this series and it is online there's a pdf there's a free pdf online so if anybody wants to read those wonderful essays the straight mind by monique Wittig, you can get that online so i'll just say something about um julia penelope's afterword here she has a piece at the end called one flaming letter um, and she gives a nice little definition here of separatism. She says, separatists, for example, maintain that the only way to free ourselves from male domination is for all females to withdraw from men, to withhold from them our energy, our nurturing, our caretaking of them. Only in this way we believe we can erode the foundation of male power and control over us. Male power is based on female complicity in our own powerlessness. And of course, it is true that the whole world economy is based upon the labor of women. Men's world survives, obviously, off the backs of women. And in those days, we used to talk, I can remember in the late 70s, talking about how all women would separate from men and then male dominance would simply collapse. We seriously talked about all of this. We talked about all sorts of other things, too, about what would happen if it came to guns in the street and we said women won't have the guns and I don't think it you know I don't think this is reasonable but we talked about in those very serious ways about the situation that we were in in those days um, and Julia Penelope also says because heterosexual feminists choose men as their sexual partners their allegiance to other feminists and especially to lesbians is divided and ambivalent at best or non-existent at worst. I, I also wanted to say something about, you know, the sort of ambition that we did have at that time, the um, huge range of our vision of how we could actually end male domination, which nobody would talk about now, really. Um, for instance, there's a piece by Penny House and uh, Lisa Cohen about how they live their separatism. And they consider that separatism is a revolutionary strategy which will enable lesbian separatists to take over, indeed, whole neighborhoods. Um, and they are the women who set up Dyke a Quarterly, which was this very important lesbian separatist journal in the States. And they say, for instance, one possibility is to take over a town gradually until all the straight people move out, the lack of jobs and companionship which was rather more peaceful than taking up arms on the street, of course. Um, but this is a sort of ambition that you, it's almost impossible to imagine now because lesbian separatism, lesbian feminism has been so erased and, and you know, just absolutely made completely, completely invisible. Um, now, since there is just a, a little bit of time, I'd like to talk about a couple of the controversies that um, exist in the book and very much existed at the time. One was about biological determinism. I know that in the UK, my experience of feminism and lesbian feminism is that pretty much everyone thought that um, male behavior and male dominance were socially constructed, but that wasn't necessarily the case for all separatists. In the US in particular, there were some who did believe it was biological. And one of them is Iandrus Moontree, and she says, I believe that males are a genetic mutation who biologically possess the traits that make them violent and death-orientated. 
this is of course a very, uh, it's a grim outlook because it means nothing can change and male domination will never change and the oppression of women will never change. So that is why generally feminists prefer to see the problem as socially constructed and they know of course they can affect enormous change and change men rather than having that rather grim outlook. Another controversy was around man hating. At the time, there were many papers written about man hating and women took about, talked about it. They had conferences, workshops about man hating. Uh, although these days that would probably seem rather strange because as I say, there isn't the same rage and therefore man hating might seem odd. And Jeffna Allen, who I did have the pleasure to meet uh, back in the 1980s and who took me on a little tour of San Francisco Bay pointing out all the wading birds. I was very into birds even then. Uh, Jeffna has written some wonderful books and she said, man-hating is my response to violence against women. The ultimate mark of man's possession of women may well be the ethic of suppression by which he forbids women to hate him. And that is of course the case. He forbids women to hate him. And she, she actually talks in this piece about one of the things that women often say, and I think they probably still say this very much now. I don't hate men, I hate what they do, which she points out is a very Christian attitude, you know, hate the sin and not the sinner. Um, so that's quite interesting that women are met very often still say that because the hatred is very hard to feel or voice or actually say. Another one of the big controversies was about boy children. And there's a piece from 1973 from Alice, Gordon, Debbie and Mary. Where are they now, I wonder? And this was one of the problems of the time is that often women had pseudonyms or didn't do their full names. So we can't find out exactly who they were, which I, I do think is a problem. They say, we can't see lesbians wasting energy on male children. And we believe therefore, that the lesbians who keep a male child, keep a male child, the lesbian who keeps a male child has placed herself in a contradiction analogous to the straight woman. Um, and at the time, many lesbians were against having children. Many, many lesbians were. That was the case in Britain in the 1970s, and particularly against the, the, what was only the only thing available to women at the time, which was to have sex with a man in order to acquire a child. But the issue of male children was hugely important and whether women should be having male children and of course they couldn't control the sex of what, that a child they had if they chose to do so. Um, there was a, a piece by Anna Lee and she calls it the tired old question of male children because of course it was a huge issue the question of whether uh, male children should be in the creche with the girl children, uh, whether they should be at the conference with their mothers, whether they should be at the dance, the women's dance, the, female, the girl children were there, should the boys be there and so on. Um, and she says, uh, Anna Lee, that um, in terms of women who would say, you know, I'm bringing up a boy child, I'm gonna bring them up differently. It's very important that we do this. This is a task of women to bring up boy children differently. That has not, I have to say, been enormously successful so far. Uh, but she says, uh, we as women can offer, or what, what we as women can offer little boys is not power. If you were a little boy, which would you choose? Power or sensitivity? Be honest, which I think is lovely, really. Of course, boys are going to go for power and they do go for power and their mother might try to bring them up to be absolutely lovely. And I'm sure in some cases it is successful. But overall, this is not a good use of women's energy to end male domination. And Annalise says, when we invite male children into our spaces, we devalue our daughters. So what she's basically saying is that the girls deserve separatism too. The girls deserve to be away from the boys who are harassing them at school, who are making their lives a misery and they deserve separatism. So we devalue our girls if we say that boys should be everywhere. And the current generation of boys brought up on pornography, of course, it's even more important that girls have separate spaces. Um, okay, so what I think we, we're good to talk about now is 
what is separatism now? Does it exist? Can it exist? Can we bring it back? How do we, the three of us, um, live out our separatism now if we are still separatists? So maybe I'll go over to Lauren first to talk about this. I have to say, I don't think I'm living a separatist life now. I, 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 have, um, I have a separatist vision. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I and, and there, there are some, um, there are some uh, people who would say that that is sufficient to, to make you a separatist. But I, I, I think that, you know, my feeling is that it, it requires, um, it requires action as well. At the moment, what I'm doing in terms of action, and and I'm as activist as I've ever been in my life uh, at the moment. But what I'm doing at the moment is is um, working within the system. I'm very much working within the system on uh, legislative advocacy here in the states, um, and and that's uh, that's as Sarah Hogan says that that's uh, the system that um, that uh, you know oppresses women and and erases lesbians. Um, but uh, that's that's what my choice is at the moment. I think that's that's where, given the fact that there's, you know, given the fact that there's not um, a well-developed um, uh, lesbian-centered community, except except it's starting up again. And I'm, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to to seeing more of it. But given that, that it's not uh, very well established as it was uh, in the middle 1970s, um, I'm. My choice is to work within the system. I feel that that's where I'm most effective. Yeah, um, I have to say that the vast majority of the separatists I ever knew always had paid jobs, at least in this in the UK, in that male system, as I did. I mean, I couldn't choose just to, to teach women, although Mary Daly tried to do that. And in the end, it lost her her job because a male infiltrator tried to come into her class. But I have always taught men tiny numbers. In my feminist classes, there would be you know, about 10 men in a 160 person class and so on. So I don't think that you're taking part in that system is not consonant with separatism. I really don't. I mean, most of, most, most of the women I know have been inside or outsiders. So they've been in the system at some place, trying to change it as they are in it, but also in the rest of their lives, being totally in a world of women but um and also when you said that the the community doesn't exist in which to be a separatist i think that's hugely important if we haven't got all of the discos and the theater and the conferences and the housing co-ops and the bookshops if we haven't got all of that it's very very hard to live your life as a separatist day to day and it can be very lonely because it means that you're stuck there in the world of heterosexuals if you haven't got a world of lesbian feminists to be in. And that becomes harder and harder. And I found that become harder and harder. So anyway, um, let's, uh, let's go over to Susan. What, what are you thinking about um, separatism? Well, I, I totally stand with my 24 year old self who, who wrote this and for which you know, the academic punishment that I got was, was a kind of cancel culture, old fashioned cancel culture. There's nothing new about that. Um, I do think that men are capable of change because I think it's very hard to have a feminist movement without that, because the other only option then is, you know, to get out with the guns and that, I, that doesn't appeal to me. Um, and I do think, you know, women, we're stuck in, in um, you know, the ways in which we were meant to behave. And we, ch we changed. We changed ourselves. We did consciousness raising. We did political projects. We did creative things. We changed ourselves because we did things together and we had a reason and we had a politics and men could change, but they don't want to. It's clear they don't want to. They've had plenty. They've had at least fifty years to start doing it, and they're not doing it. Um, I continue to live a basic feminist uh, separatist lifestyle. I work with women. I promote women's work through publishing. All my emotional energy is directed towards women. And while there are a few men in my life, I have a brother, a nephew, and a few male colleagues. Um, they are few. Um, I was really, really happy to join the lesbian community in 1974. And as I recently wrote on a blog on the Spinifex website, it was the best decision of my life. 
and I stand by that. I said that in India a couple of years ago at a writers' festival, and um, there were a whole lot of young lesbians in the front row, and they were cheering um, because I was saying all these outrageous things, which you can do when you're in a different country, much easier. <laughs> but yeah, so oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, so I'm still basically living a separatist lifestyle. It's just that there's not as such a big community around me. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on something that, that Susan said uh, or alluded to, uh, which was that we changed ourselves. We really transformed our own consciousness. That was so much a part of what happened. And I, uh, if there were more time, I, I would have talked about um, uh, the Clit Collective uh, uh, piece, piece about uh, transforming, uh, transformation of consciousness. Oh, I mean, sorry, I, I, get, I, I didn't I, give you the opportunity to talk about that, but do say what you would like to say. Yeah. Well, yes, just to, there's no time to, to get into the chapter, but I, I just really wanted to, to talk about how, um, I mean, I, I lived on a, on a collective uh, in, the, in the 1970s with, with lesbians. It was a, it was a um, we acted, we, we lived together and it's good that I was not even 30 years old at the time because um, I didn't, we didn't have time to sleep because we were, we were, we were working on transforming ourselves continuously. Um, and, and we transformed the way that we interacted with each other. We, we, it was as though our whole lives were conducted like a consciousness raising uh, group. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, uh, we treated each other with great respect and we, we, we aimed for uh, an absence of hierarchy um, in, in all, all ways. We treated each other as family, but without the hierarchy, right? That's, that's what we were, were striving for. And, I, I so that and and we did we changed ourselves we did change ourselves we all learned I learned to to do organic gardening which for the city girl you know and and they learned um to ride and maintain motorcycles and we, we all we all learned these these um these dikey skills you know uh and and it wasn't just that we, that we focused inwardly it, it we also changed Hanover New Hampshire completely we turned it on its ear um, it, it was all, all of a piece, and I just throw that out there. No, that's great. I, th I think absolutely we changed ourselves, and we're only at the very beginning of thinking, can this happen again? Because we're in such a, a, a difficult situation at the moment. I mean, what do either of you think about creating separatism again? Is it going to happen? We know that there are places where it is, which is Korea, and uh, there's some interest in Spain. So there are places, in the, and China. So there are places in the world where it all seems to be happening again with, with as much rage as we had then. But I don't know about Western countries. What do you think? Um, I, I think it, it, it can, it can happen, but it needs to have intent, you know, uh, and it's more, probably more likely um, to have communities set up by younger women because as Lauren said, you know, we were up all night talking. We were changing ourselves. I mean, I learned to, every now and again, I think about all the things I learned during, you know, from the 20s through to, say, my mid-30s. It was like a sponge, you know, because I was living with so many different women with different skills, with different knowledge, with different backgrounds. And, you know, that, that's, that's what helps you doing. So sharing, having shared households getting into squats in London, you know, that was another big thing too. Um, and, you know, that that creates the impetus, which is why some of the women went off to the countryside and built houses and ran, ran the land. Um, not everybody can do that, but anybody can do it in a city community in a shared household. It's possible. You just have to want to do it. That's right. And, yes, indeed, and anybody can start the huge changes that lead to that separatism, which is you reading women's books, cutting male books and energy out of their lives in various different ways, and then the politics of men and so on. So there are many different steps into the sort of separatism we've been talking about. OK, I think we should probably end this section, this session, but on a, a reasonably hopeful note, which is that I do think that these things are coming back and the youngsters would create something different but it will come back in some form or another. So thank you very, very much, Lauren and Susan. And we will finish there for today. 
Thank you for giving me the chance to speak about my book after all these years. <laughs> I know. Ah, but it is there, and that's so great. Okay, bye-bye, sisters. Bye. Bye-bye.